Okay, I'd like to introduce um, my colleague Kova Lamar Prieto, who's going to give a talk on Spanish English bilingualism in California from a historical sociolinguistic perspective. Pass it. Thank you very much, and as a, as a proof that we are truly interdisciplinary, you are beginning with someone in the humanities. But before that, let me use one minute of my time to recognize the work that Judy Kroll has done to bring us all here together. So if you allow me, now that we're beginning, I would like to begin with an applause for her. I'm going to make this big so that you can see it. The negotiation between Spanish and, and English in California was not always difficult, believe it or not. During the first 30 years in which California was a state of the US, the Constitution recognized the presence of Spanish and English in equal terms. In equal terms. Can you believe it now? What has happened from then to now? So allow me to, to walk with you for a little while, even briefly, through what has brought us to the point in which we are now. An individual born in California at the end of the 19th century would have been, to 1821, a subject of Spain, then from 1821 to 1847, which, which was the end of the war in California, it, he, would have been, he or she would have been a citizen of Mexico, and afterwards, from 1848 onwards, a citizen of the United States. So after the annexation, language became an index of participation, or not participation. So with the incorporation of California to the US, the process of social linguistic identitary formation of the Californios came to an abrupt end. That means that they were moved into a different identitarian schema, so to say. As the concepts of, of race and the colonial perspective of race was different in the Anglo-Saxon context and the Hispanic context, suddenly language became the only thing that was salient enough to indicate who belonged and who did not belong. And with no intention of being political here, but you know. <laughs> the index of participation in a culture it was very salient. And in 1854, Farham was going to write one of the most famous guides to come to California and said, their very language is a furious hyperbole. And their entire nature as people is the superlative degree of the adjective frothy, without a substant substantive of any sort to qualify. The lifted chivalry of Spain was buried in the tombs of the American discoverers and conquerors. Its corslet and spear have fallen into the hands of their Indian Spanish descendants. And a more worthless rabble of bastards never assumed the name of a nation. That's it. 1854. Can you believe it again? <laughs> so this idea of language and race slash identity slash many other things was entangled for the very, from the very beginning. So the Spanish had been in the area for a relatively short period of time. I, I think we're all aware of that. The mission story is a, not even a nice story, but it's a story, just a fiction. Spanish was the language of the conquest, and then, right immediately, became the language of the conquered. So it was a, it was a difficult step to move forward. However, the presence, even when the presence of the dialect became less and less transparent as the, as the, as the 19th century advanced, there was a vernacular Spanish in the works. So this vernacular Spanish, California Spanish, is a historical vernacular Spanish with ties with Los Angeles vernacular Spanish. So I have two assumptions here. First one, there's a dialect of Spanish in Southern California, which is obvious. I, I, would, I would go into that if you want, but afterwards. And the second one is that 
is that that dialect has a story. It does not pop up in the streets yesterday at night. It has a long story in the making. So there has been many arguments against this idea of a vernacular Spanish in Southern California. First one, Spanish was never healthy enough in California. Spanish disappeared right after, dissolved with the annexation. And even that there were no able speakers of Spanish in Southern California. That's fun, I know. And I'm making lots of friends with the quotes, but anyway. <laughs> so my assumption of the existence of a dialect of California in California is based on 10 years of doing this. I, I'm afraid I have many more ahead of me, but I have examined more than 120,000 documents, different documents, manuscript documents. I have transcribed and edited about 100,000 words as of today. And these documents belong from 1804 to 1886, and they are being forgotten in different libraries and archives all around California. If you go to your public library, that's likely they have some of them. So I have tried, even when historical documentation is, is difficult to settle in that sense, I've tried to make as many social linguistic variables available. And I'm particularly happy with the presence of many letters written by females. And the quantity of, of texts written in Spanish decreases as, as the time advances. As, that's, that is to say, is the theory. That is to say, that means that from 1860 onwards, we're gonna find less texts. That could mean that there were less texts written. That could mean that I have not found them. Either of those. One of the reasons could be that the public documents begin to be less frequent. And they are less frequent because if you wanted to get, apparently the justice was bilingual, and we'll go, we'll go to that. But if you wanted to get a court document in Spanish in, I don't know, San Bernardino County, in 1856, you had to pay triple the, the price, the, the, the amount, to have it in Spanish. You had to pay the document in English, and then you have to pay it three times more to have it in Spanish. So that's likely that that, that made, that was a deterrent to getting the same document. And to understand the public presence of, of a Spanish language in California and how decisions that were taken more than a century and a half ago have affected us, we need to stop by the Constitution. The Constitution in, 18, in 1850 recognized California as a bilingual state, as I mentioned at the beginning. All laws, decrees, regulations, and provisions emanating from all the powers of this, of this state, which from their nature require publication, shall be published in English and Spanish. That was 1850. However, 1880. All the laws of the state of California and all the official writings and the executive, legislative, and judicial proceedings shall be conducted, preserved, and published in no other than the English language. So it's a jump. It's three decades of, I guess, complicated bilingualism in California. While the, during the first time, the first constitution, Spanish was not only allowed but protected, the second one, it's going to be really different. But this is the letter of the law. What happened in reality maybe was not that good. So Francisco Ramirez writes in a Los Angeles newspaper in, in Spanish in 1855, and I have made a translation. But Desde el año 1849 ha existido cierta animosidad entre los mexicanos y americanos tan ajena a un pueblo tan magnánimo y libre, de manera que estos han deseado con todo su corazón que los mexicanos todos no tuvieran más que un solo pescuezo para cortárselo. So the Spanish language was progressively being taken away from the instances of power. That created a de facto bilingual situation in which Spanish was spoken in the house and not out of the house. The most visible, and I'm going to provide you with some examples of that. The most visible feature of Los Angeles vernacular Spanish is this going back and forth, this, this being free, the happy coexistence of bilingualism between Spanish and English. And we can find that not in our students, 
many of my, my students are sitting here and they, they move back and forth between Spanish and English quite frequently. And it was present here. In 1886, you, I found, you can find this, this little poem published in a newspaper in Northern California. And when I translated it into English, I noticed that it's way more fun. But anyway, <laughs> conocí aquí en California una paisana muy bella con 18 primaveras. Mas como estaba educada a la americana escuela, inglesaba algunas frases que olían a gringo a la legua. Con frecuencia se le oía llamar al cesto basqueta, a las cuadras por bloques, a un cerco decirle fensa, al café llamarlo cofe, a los mercados marqueta, al bodegón grosería. So, apparently, the, these salient features of Spanish and English in contact in Southern California were already there by the first decades after the annexation. And I'm going to provide you some examples from my corpus. One of them, I, some of them I really like. Nuestros padres fueron los verdaderos pioneers de este país privilegiado. Says Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. If you, haven't, if you have gone to, to, I guess everyone goes to drink wine, but if you have gone to Napa for any reason, <laughs> if you have gone to Napa for any reason, I, I guess the majority of people goes to drink wine, I went to see Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo's house. And, Okay, drink wine, but to see Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo's house. And if you go there and, and see the house, you understand how, how his concept of the world marked his understanding of what California was. He is writing to one of his cousins and saying, hey, 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 wait, what's this? We are the conquerors here. Our fathers were the conquerors of here, the pioneers of here, the true pioneers of this land. And the idea that he uses pioneers means an expansion on the concept of conquerors from the idea, from the, the Hispanic entanglement idea to the Anglo-American idea of what a conqueror and what a pioneer is. Because are pioneers, where are pioneers from? And another Author says, como testigo ocular que he sido, puedo asegurar que Nueva Ulbetia fue objeto de un escuateo formidable. Because they had the squatters. And the last one that I really like, procura ver si los taxes de Pudenciana no están pagados, no sea que la vayan a rematar. These sentences, these, these uses of, of Spanish and English, are perfectly normal today. But they were perfectly normal, at least in... in we are... We are talking about what was written, which is always different from what you use in common speak. So this was, these things were the ones that were written. So these reveal, reveal many terms that are considered corruptions and are, that are corrected everywhere in high schools all around California. Don't say taxes. Se dice impuestos. So this had been corrected for centuries now. The Constitutional Convention of 1879 had among the items under discussion one particularly has debate among the delegates from the South and those from the North. And I know it's a, it's a, it's a long thing, but apparently Mr. Tinin considered that after 30 years, those living in, in the Golden State should speak English or otherwise they were not. They were not natives, they were foreign people. And they ask him, do you call the native population of this state foreigners? And he responds, they had ample time to learn the language. So the delegates, especially the delegate from San Bernardino, just in case one of you is interested, was really pushing to keep the state bilingual because Southern California was still bilingual, while Northern California, because of land grants, was, let's say, less bilingual or more English prone. And I, I couldn't help myself, but indulge me. Mr. Tinin, which is one of my new favorite friends, says, I know when I say that hundreds of those who pretend to be citizens of California are recent immigrants from Sonora and other portion of Mexico. Some of them are bandits, cutthroats, and robbers that come in and are placed under great register and vote here. I believe that they are not citizens. It's an outrage upon the institutions of our country, 1879. 
Many of them make it their business to rob and plunder, and they avail themselves of this opportunity to deprive the citizens of the United States of the influence of their votes. We have opened the doors of our public schools to them and their children, and attempted to educate them under the general influence of our schools, and if 30 years will not do it, I think we had better send missionaries into the county from which the gentleman from San Bernardino comes. I want a period placed with importations of Mexicans to this country. So, as some of us came to California to benefit from the public school system, me, <laughs> that's true, last year, Elizabeth Davis and myself decided to began a, begin a study, a study about documented and undocumented and documented student, students on campus and their use of Spanish. So it was a study on the well-being and academic integration, emotional linguistics, of the documented students on campus. And I'm going to present, we're going to present a very small thing because we're working on this. We have been working on this for a very short period of time, somehow I would say pressed by the circumstances. So we have 28 participants with access to different situations. And we ask them, we, we ask them, among other things, about their use of English and Spanish and the interaction of both languages. And it says that they, they told us that they used Spanish in the house and English outside of it for the most part. And some of them tried to use Spanish inside and outside and English in the house and English outside of it just in one case. But we still have that kid that wants to speak English in the house even when their parents don't speak English. That one kid among us. And we asked them too, in which language do you speak to your father to or mother, grandparents, and the family in general? So we are finding that they, they talk in Spanish to the mother all the time, to the father not all the time. And that some of them begin speaking English with their siblings as soon as they reach here. And they establish their social relations in school and in the neighborhood, there's a typo in there, I'm sorry. They establish this relation mostly in English with those around them. The majority of, of, occasion, of the occasions, and this, this is qualitative, the, the responses, out of fear of being signed out, of being, you know. So with this sad note, I leave you with the old expression of goodbye, vaya con Dios, meaning go with God. This was one, this was one, I, I took that photograph at the Mission San Juan Capistrano years ago. They took the, they took the plague out, I think, because I was shaming them all around. But <laughs> you live with the old expression of goodbye, vaya con Dios, meaning go with God. This is a complete nonsense. <laughs> it is not old. It's an expression, I agree with that. It is not an old expression. My grandma used to say it. My grandma was not young, but you know. <laughs> We're talking in historical terms. At the same time, vaya con Dios doesn't mean go with God. It does not. And it is a nice interaction between the presence of Spanish, English, and also the idea of the missions, all together folklorizing the presence of Spanish language in California as a token of something that, yeah, it's there, it's cute when you put it on a plate, but it's not cute when, I, when it's out there. Uh -huh. So thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Many, many of the letters that I have are family letters, family members. Writing to whom? So, so my question is? Among family members. And also I have commercial letters from small businesses. 
but the majority of the letters are from family letters. So people writing lo uh -huh. long distance families. So exactly. obviously people that were bilingual uh -huh. that lived far. Okay, there. There's many letters too that I'm beginning to work with that are family letters that grandkids that are mostly English speakers, write to their grandpas and grandmas to practice their Spanish. Ah. They're cute. Ah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I have more questions, but I can ask okay. you later. Thank you. Thank you.